would like to introduce to you our keynote speaker for the evening. Dr. Steve Brodsky is the Assistant Unit Leader of the U.S. Geological Survey's New York Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit and an Assistant Professor in the Department of Natural Resources and Environment at Cornell University. He's a broadly trained applied ecologist, entomologist, and sustainability scientist. Steve earned his PhD in wildlife ecology from North Carolina State University and conducted research on solar energy and desert ecosystems as a postdoc scholar and research ecologist at the University of California, Davis. He specializes in the emerging field of renewable energy ecology, leading projects that span terrestrial and aquatic environments, diverse taxa, and various energy technologies, including solar, wind, and forest bioenergy. Dr. Grodsky and his collaborators conduct solutions-oriented research that tackles pressing environmental issues and guides a sustainable energy transition. So I will turn it over to, to him, Dr. Grodsky. Great. Thanks very much for the intro, and thanks for the organizers for your hospitality. And I'd like to give a shout out to my colleagues, Natalie West and Josh Campbell, for showing me around the last couple of days so I could check out some of these well paths and pipelines and the like. It's my first time being out here, uh, and it's really exciting for me to see this. I like to step outside my comfort zone, see what's going on, uh, and take a holistic approach to inform my research program. So I really appreciate you all being here and uh, listening to what I have to say. So... My research program centers on renewable energy ecology, which is the study of interactions among energy development ecosystems and people. And some of you may be wondering why I'm here. <laughs> and one of the central arguments I'd like to make in my talk is that, in fact, energy development is an anthropogenic disturbance. It doesn't necessarily matter what the technology is that we're speaking about when it comes down to the science of it. I think there's a lot to be learned, and I don't think there's any reason from a scientific standpoint, uh, when considering these anthropogenic disturbances and ecological responses to separate conventional and renewable energy. Uh, I think, you know, in, as we transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy broadly, right? That not, there's no direct cutoff, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, it opens up new opportunities to sort of re-envision our approach to things like reclamation or siting or site preparation, or maybe more broadly, our philosophy about how energy development fits into ecosystems. And dare I say that energy development is, and people are part of ecosystems. That's the other thing I like to emphasize is that there's really, you know, again, from, from a scientific standpoint, Humans are part of ecosystems. We know we need energy, right? We don't need to go and live in a van down by the river and eat raw trout barefoot and whatnot. But I think if we, if, if we learn from this point in time when there's a lot of movement with uh, renewable energy development, that there are a lot of applications to oil and gas development. And when we talk about energy transitions and when we talk about... Um, how energy is being developed and produced through time, just because there's a renewable energy boom doesn't mean, obviously, we all know here that there can be other booms in energy, including um, oil and gas development. So I've taken the approach through time of looking at a blank screen. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. So I've taken, as I've gone through my career, right, I've been focusing uh, on certain topics. Wildlife ecology is where I started. And as an applied ecologist, I was hoping to inform conservation and management of wildlife species uh, in the context of contemporary global change, things that are happening in the real world right now. And renewable energy was one of those things. And I happened to fall into a master's program studying wind energy and birds and bats. I then studied forest fire energy, uh, birds, insects, solar energy development in the desert. And uh, now in my current position, 
and as my viewpoint of the world has has grown, right, I'm starting to think about things a lot more broadly and realizing that soils, plants, people, landforms, right? There, there's a lot going on there that might span beyond wildlife ecology. But just having that start really gave me a firm basis to build a more holistic understanding of informing what we might call a sustainable energy transition, which includes both conventional and renewable energy development. So expanding from that, you know, we can consider some broader topics in terms of how we might approach conservation uh, in the context of meeting these renewable energy targets, which are inextricably linked to uh, conventional energy use. And I'll get a little bit more into detail about that momentarily. But the idea here is that there's multiple objectives occurring at the same time. So some of you might be aware of the of the um, 30 by 30 initiatives, so conserving 30% of lands and waters by 2030. There's also very aggressive goals to meet um, emission reductions by that time as well. And what that's doing is creating a sort of a pinch point where we have multiple goals, timelines for those goals are aligning, and we need to figure out how to do it. Um, and I think that it presents sort of a, an interesting challenge and also opportunities to engage in, in creative solutions to try to meet these goals. Um, and this isn't all just hippy dippy stuff, right? I think in terms of when we talk about ideas of, of, about climate change and, and things of that nature and how oil and gas development fits into it, I think there's a, there's, there needs to be a realistic approach in the sense that, you know, that oil and gas development is going to happen, right? And, and it's part of the energy portfolio um, of the United States. But globally, I think there is a renewable energy transition at play that we can learn from. So in terms of connections, right, there's really no renewable energy development going on that doesn't involve uh, conventional energies. So we need to transport uh, pieces of wind turbines, for example, across the country. I worked at this solar facility. I mentioned it earlier today. This is Ivanpah Solar Energy Generating System. Uh, the, this is a concentrating solar power facility where there are thousands and thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of mirrors. And these mirrors beam light into the central tower, which has a liquid in it, and then boils, it creates steam, it turns a turbine and creates electricity. Uh, turns out that the sun doesn't really get hot enough to do that until about midday and they get them rolling with natural gas every morning. <laughs> and uh, it's just an example of how, you know, there's an integration of, of conventional fuels into renewable energy development that I think gets ignored when people talk about the renewable energy transition. So if you're talking about realistic solutions, I think you need to consider a holistic approach. Um, and that's sort of the standpoint I take as an applied scientist, because when you're talking about solutions, you're talking about working with people who are doing things on the ground. So y'all have that opportunity to, you know, if you're interested, explore some of these ideas in the sense that the real change that all these scientists are talking about happens with practitioners, it happens with folks on the ground. And that's why I engage with renewable energy industry consistently. Another commonality between renewable energy development and, and oil and gas is that a lot of it happens on public lands with mandates for multiple uses. And I think that theme sort of resonates here out west quite a bit. I have a lot of studies uh, in the Mojave and Sonoran deserts on Bureau land management lands, uh, logo up here. But the idea is that, you know, we, we have these public lands, there's mandates for energy use, and then there's also other goals, it might be, uh, you know, conservation, it might be other types of land uses, be they extractive or otherwise. And so thinking about this again, holistically, there's a lot of commonalities. And the reason why I'm setting this up is because I'm going to get into some nitty gritty about some results from renewable energy that I can 
pretty much guarantee you from a scientific standpoint would apply to, to uh, what y'all are dealing with up in here. So what I'd like to do now is present to you a little case study. And this is a, a paper we published that has to do with solar energy development. And it gets at site preparation. And I think that there's sort of a, when we talk about reclamation, I finally said the word that everyone, <laughs> that we're here for, reclamation, that's on the back end, right? And I have a hunch that if you focus you, us, whoever, developers of any energy type, focus on sort of the, the front end of things such as siting and site preparation, at least in the renewable energy world, what we're seeing is that that can in turn affect what you're doing after the energy is, the energy facility is built in terms of reclamation, uh, or restoration or conservation. So these are the th four treatments that we were, the three treatments and a control that we were working with in, in this experiment. And they include blading, which is essentially bulldozing. Uh, and you can see the pictorial representations of these treatments here, mowing, uh, what, what they called a halo, which was kind of interesting because it had this angelic kind of feel to it. Um, but the idea is that it was just undeveloped patches within the solar facility itself and then undeveloped desert controls. So when considering things like siting and site preparation in this case, I think it can impact what happens on the ground once a once the facility is built and the construction is done. So in terms of, I, I really see this kind of resonating more with pipelines in the sense that some of these solar facilities are six, 7,000 acres, 9,000 acres. They're really big, a lot of them, especially in the desert Southwest. And they could be big uh, in other places in the West. And when I think about kind of the, construction process, the development process, site preparation. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of similarities with pipelines in the sense that, you know, the pipelines are kind of long and linear and seem to go on forever. And, you know, you have these solar facilities in this case that are more compartmentalized, but on a per area basis, I think it's, it's probably quite comparable. And you can see that these solar facilities oftentimes can look similar to what you might see at a construction site for, for various development activities. So what we found in terms of the ecological response of the desert uh, plant community in this case to uh, the site preparation treatments is, is that there are drastic differences in uh, plant heights, for example. So in figure A, you can see that in the bladed treatments, uh, those dots are representing the uh, perennial, average perennial plant heights in the given plot, in the given uh, uh, sites. And what we're seeing, to sum it up, is that the undeveloped patches and the inside the solar facility and the uh, vegetation outside of the solar facility and the control, we're seeing about the same plant heights. There's no statistical difference. Uh, in the mode plots, we're seeing a, a, a difference between the control and the undeveloped patches, slightly lower, or statistically lower, but still way higher than bladed, bulldozing. Bulldozing is bad, essentially, <laughs> which might not be the most groundbreaking uh, thing you've ever heard, but it turns out people still do a lot of bulldozing. <laughs> Y'all might be familiar with some of that uh, bulldozing. And then in panel B, what we're showing here is that some plants are more sensitive to disturbance than others. Uh, specifically, these are plants that undergo the Crisulian acid metabolism. These plants are adapted to hot, arid environments. So cacti and yucca, for example, turns out if you do anything to them, if you bulldoze them or if you mow them, they don't grow back. Whereas shrubs like creosote and ambrosia demosa do. So there are differences in, in plants in terms of how they respond 
to disturbance. Uh, the kind of illustration here, which I'll get to a little bit in terms of the social side, is that some of these plants have high values. It could be economic value or it could be cultural value, could, could be other values, and I'll get into that in a little bit. And then C, what that's showing is uh, the relative abundance of a genus of plants called schismus, and that's an invasive grass. And turns out they really like bulldozing. <laughs> and uh, there's a whole lot more invasive plants where the, the, there was bulldozing for site preparation for solar energy development than mowing or, or just uh, leaving undeveloped patches. That could be a concern because in the desert environment, Chismus can spread fire. I assume we don't wanna have the solar facilities on fire. I think there, again, this will come full circle, but these are results, empirical results from an energy development study, right? Happened to be solar. What we were able to do after understanding the response of the individual plant species to different site preparation treatments is create what we called an ecosystem service-based value system, <laughs> which to a practitioner probably sounds like a bunch of mumbo jumbo. And when I say it, it does too, but essentially what, or when I hear it, I, I kind of get that, but it's a fancy way of saying like, what's the use of these plants in the sense of these different categories that have been developed to describe nature services to people, ecosystem services, there's provisioning, regulating habitat services and cultural services. And we could look through the literature and determine what check a box, a zero or a one, a one if a, if a plant is uh, covering some sort of ecosystem service described in some sort of framework. The cultural services especially was interesting and also probably biased because what we did was we based it off of a lot of anthropological literature. We weren't able to actually engage with the these indigenous communities, but the idea is that these plants have cultural value and we can quantify the effects of, on these cultural values by understanding first the species response to the disturbance and then using this value system to quantify the effects on the ecosystem services themselves. What we're able to show again is that, you know, intensive site preparation can lead to a significant reduction in cultural services based on these data. And there's a couple listed, a couple categories listed here. This sort of framework could be applied in in the context of any cultural heritage. Um, in this case, it was Native Americans in the desert Southwest. You can also see that mowing, for example, had no different, was not statistically different than leaving undeveloped patches inside of the solar facility. So it's a bit more intensive, but we're not seeing a, a, a huge drop in cultural services. There's a large social component to energy development, which we discussed already. One of the ways to contextualize that social component is to better understand the interaction between values and ecological response. I just exemplified how to do it in one way just now. There's probably others. But I think it's important to note that in terms of the efficacy of development, as a whole, any kind of energy development, if you're, if you're looking at it from a holistic standpoint, it's important to understand how different on the ground construction activities, site preparation, siting, and so on, management operations can affect uh, ecosystem components that are of some value to people. I think that a lot of the response, negative response to to development can stem from cultural heritages that are linked to uh, ecological components of the of these systems. We also looked at pollinators uh, at the, at these same study sites. We, we looked at ants. Josh knows about the pollinators. I we get we collaborated with other folks at USDA. Uh, on the ants. 
That's a picture of me losing my mind in the desert, which is pretty cool. And what we were able to find is that bees don't like bulldozing either. <laughs> um, however, in some cases, we, we didn't see a difference in these undeveloped patches inside the solar facility and um, undeveloped desert outside of it. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and how it might relate to some of these uh, well pad reclamation activities. We also saw that in general, the, the ant communities significantly differed uh, between all the other treatments and the, the uh, bulldoze treatments. So there's been an evolution in site preparation with solar energy development in the desert. And I bring this up because I think there are ways to re-envision site preparation for any type of energy development. So what you can see here is this is in the Mojave Desert in Nevada. And in between, so this is a start of a, of a solar facility. The poles are in place. They'll, they'll attach the panels to those, uh, those, those poles there. And in the middle, what they did is something called drive and crush. Uh, drive and crush is what it sounds like. They just run over stuff. But it turns out it's a lot better than bulldozing it, and it's a lot better than mowing it. So the idea is that in the beginning, with solar development, it was all bulldozing. Then there was mowing. Then there was driving crush. Each With each evolution, it beca the site preparation become, became less intensive, and there was no real drop in the rate of development. So to me, that signals that there could be wiggle room for re-envisioning site preparation for things like oil and gas as well, in terms of pipelines, where maybe instead of bulldozing, there could be opportunities to perhaps mow and do the, and do the construction or other less intensive site preparation activities that will in turn result in a reduction in cost for reclamation because you didn't disturb the site as much to begin with. I mentioned this already, but with the bees, I showed a particular species of bee. Um, this is for all the bees in, in a particular year. And we were able to show that, again, in, the, in these undeveloped patches inside the solar facility, so, the, so this is a significantly disturbed area but in these undeveloped patches, all the plants were just left there, right? There was no disturbance whatsoever apart from them being surrounded by uh, heliostats in this case. And we're not seeing a difference in, in, in uh, the count of bees between those areas and outside of the solar facility. And I think this has implications, there it is, for uh, kind of thinking about how we might envision landscape ecology in the context of uh, oil and gas development, and in turn, how reclamation can can sort of stem from that. So this map, I'd just like to show the, so those diamonds are representing the dispersion of these undeveloped patches throughout the, the three power blocks of the solar facility. And it's six miles across from one corner to the other. So there's, from a landscape ecology perspective, you have disturbed areas with inter, interdispersed with undisturbed areas inside of the solar arrays. The reason I bring this up is because the more evidence we continue to accumulate from these solar studies in this case, um, I'm inclined to say that there might be similar responses by birds. We're starting to see some preliminarily some of that in New York with grassland birds and solar development. And what I'm getting at is that there's this concept of landscape ecology. When you think about oil, the, these well pads on the landscape, they might be small, just like these undeveloped patches were small in respect to the grand landscape. But what we're seeing is that if you consider things like patches, corridors, borders, and so on, a landscape ecology approach that the cumulative effects can be beneficial to pollinators, for example. And in turn, you might be able to increase pollination services to crops 
or at the very least look good for not killing a bunch of pollinators. People like them now. Um, so if you think about this scenario, right, we have a series of developed areas in a matrix of undeveloped areas. These are essentially patches. And I think that through the reclamation process, if you were to go and reclaim these sites with a re-envisioned purpose, perhaps it's pollinator habitat, which by the way is really big right now with solar energy development. That's the big selling point, right? It's like, it's going to be pollinator habitat. Like it's going to be awesome. <laughs> no one really knows what that is. And I have a, a project funded by the DOE that's kind of like, well, what I call pollinator solar, pollinator friendly solar demystified. I forget what I called it when I submitted the proposal. It wasn't that, but that's kind of what it is. It's like, you know, there's this idea of, of stimulating energy development through these kind of biodiversity uh, like goals, but we don't really know exactly how it works. But what we're starting to see with, the, with these empirical results that I just presented is that there is something there in terms of landscape ecology, energy development, and kind of re-envisioning how energy gets put on, how energy facilities gets put onto the landscape. And so if you think about it from that perspective, I think there's opportunities to uh, engage in some activities that could be kind of neat to span beyond, you know, re reclaiming the site, getting the veg straight. And I get it that there's operational stuff you have to take care of, but I'm curious to see if there might be ways to kind of extend beyond that. So here's a map from some colleagues at, in, at uh, Argonne National Lab. And what they're showing is this potential, potential for uh, pollinator friendly solar development to contribute to pollination services. Now you'll see that North Dakota has zero, but but that you have to have solar facilities to actually have this thing work. So I feel like those, yeah, I mean, the zeros are really just, there's, I don't know, I guess not hardly any solar facilities are there. You can't, this metric doesn't actually work if you don't have solar facilities there. But the idea is that in general, there's potential for pollinator habitat reclamation at solar facilities to enhance pollination services in neighboring agricultural fields. So the idea is that you're creating a source for pollinators that are then going and pollinating crops in, in surrounding fields. And this actually works out pretty well uh, in places like the Midwest, where you know if you go and develop a solar facility, you establish plants, floor resources, for pollinators and that solar facility is surrounded by 2000 acres of corn, then yeah, you're gonna attract more pollinators there than you would in a monoculture of corn. And in turn, there could be insect pollinated crops that can benefit from it. So the idea is that it's not, there's potential for reclamation of, of some of the sites y'all are dealing with to, um, you know, if you, I think it's possible to get at not just things like pollinator conservation, but maybe ecosystem services that are of interest as well. So that brings us to this concept of pollinator friendly solar and how to actually do it on the ground. And again, I think, you know, similarities exist. What we see in the beginning of of solar development is kind of that same deal, sort of a blank slate. You want to reduce uh, operations and maintenance costs, having to mow vegetation a bunch. And so really it started with just, first there was gravel. <laughs> then there was just bare dirt. And uh, through time, there's been this sort of movement for planting native plants and, and so on. And again, increasing pollinator habitat is one uh, objective, but it comes with the whole suite of, of different potential outcomes that have to do with erosion control, hydrology, and so on. And uh, that, that again, that evolution has been reflected as not just site prep, that things have been changing 
in terms of solar development. It's also been on the back end after it's built, how to sort of reclaim or restore these uh, sites. What was initially done is, you know, the seed mixes were kind of these DOT seed mixes that were put into play. Um, some of them were, you know, pretty, I guess it was just turf grass. And through, that was kind of the standard for quite a bit of time with, with, uh, with solar energy development. Then you have these super boutique sites that I'm starting to encounter and, and working with folks where the seed mixes are very detailed and it's unclear how well this would acclimate to sort of industrial build out of, of solar. These sites are pretty small and it's done you know, by, a, by a very particular individual who's a landscape architect and dealing with these sort of very intricate seed mixes. But the point is, that is evolving. And then you can have a, you'll have a mix for in between the panels. You'll have a mix for under the panels. You'll have a mix for under the panels and wet sites, dry sites, and so on. And so it's possible to kind of increase the, the, the diversity of plants and still maintain a lot of the uh, goals for, for rec reclaiming these sites in the sense of erosion control, pollinator habitat, uh, and decreasing uh, negative hydrological effects. And I know y'all are interested in seed mixes to some extent, and I think the seed mixes really can be dictated by what your ultimate goals are. Um, I'll get into a little phytoremediation stuff too, but it's possible to, to design some of these seed mixes to get at broader goals or maybe comprehensive or concurrent goals. And what that looks like on the landscape in terms of those seed mixes I just showed, there are these different, um, the, the symbology showing where it's physically located on the, in a given solar facility. So it's very kind of intricate, but I think over time, it could be somewhat easily adapted. And if you're talking about five to seven acre uh, well pads, I think it's possible to perhaps diversify seed mixes to the point where you're achieving multiple objectives at the same time. And that's what we're seeing with solar. Here's a, an example of a, of a site. The other thing is with solar energy, you're restricted to plants that don't grow above the drip line of the solar panels. That's going to introduce shading and decrease production. I think you'd have a lot more flexibility with some of these well pads after their decommission, I don't, there wouldn't be a height restriction and probably open up even a broader suite of, of plant species you might consider in the reclamation process. And maybe some of this is already going on, I'm not quite sure, but it seems like there's room for growth in the sense of maybe thinking about the possibilities for, for reclamation um, to achieve multiple objectives. There's also a lot of talk in the solar world about co-location. Uh, if you're gonna go and put native plants in the ground and floor resources, a lot of times nowadays, it's accompanied by the co-location of apiaries. So this is honeybee production. It's a little unclear uh, how exactly this qualifies as pollinator friendly. We're looking into competition actually between honeybees and native bees and restored or reclaimed. Um, it's kind of interesting. Everyone in the renewable energy sector calls it restoration, but now I'm starting to think maybe it's reclamation. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, but the idea is that, you know, there, there's, a, there's a general concept of co-location. And I think it really stems from land use competition, which after driving around out here a couple of days, <laughs> maybe it doesn't apply here as much. It seems like space is a pretty abundant natural resource here. But in, in other places in the United States, there's, a, there's really intense competition between ag 
conservation and uh, solar energy development. And I think to some extent that can happen anywhere, regardless of how much space you have, there are limitations in terms of you know, interconnection and, and technical potential. But the idea is with co-location, you can reduce land use competition by kind of stacking multiple things on the same unit of land. In this case, it's apiaries. We also have a sheep grazing study going on at Cornell, solar grazing, I guess you could call it. And in this, this seed mix, it, and again, like in terms of your management of objectives or your reclamation objectives, they can, and, and how you go about achieving them, they can kind of depend on what your goals are. In this sense, there was, they planted what was called a fuzz and buzz seed mix because they wanted it to be good for bees and they wanted it to be good for sheep. And it and this was this particular solar facility was built in an old field, which out east is like basically an ag field that's going through succession and there's a native seed bank and eventually it would become a forest if nobody did anything to it. But it turns out that uh, just leaving the site, there were two treatments, this fuzz and buzz and then this and leaving it fallow. And what ended up happening is that there was really no difference in forage quality for the sheep or floor resources for bees between the expensive fuzz and buzz and just straight up leaving it <laughs> the way it was, just fallow, just leave it fallow. And the native seed bank grew up and provided just as much or more resources than the planted seed mix. And I've talked to my USDA colleagues about the, the potential for that, essentially leveraging the native seed bank. And I guess it's possibly applicable to uh, pipelines after seeing them well pass, I'm thinking it's not there, but um, something to consider. And solar grazing is another example, another example of co-location. There's also potential in terms of in re-envisioning or adapting reclamation here to get at things like species conservation. So, you know, threatened and endangered species or species that are at conservation risk. That's been a big selling point with, uh, with solar energy facilities in the sense of contributing to species conservation in, in, in some manner, or at least reclaiming some of the lost habitat from the development itself. Is anyone here familiar with the term regenerative agriculture? So this is a big thing with solar as well. So when you, I, this is kind of neat because I, because I'm understanding with these well pads, you know, you're, it's a, it's not a, they can be around for a while. And it reminds me of solar leases, right? So a solar lease is 30 years, right? And then it's going to be decommissioned. So all the solar panels that are out there 30 years from now, supposedly, they're going to be taken down. <laughs> um, and the idea behind this regenerative agriculture as it pertains to solar energy development is that you can put plants in the ground that whose roots will, you know, go down pretty deep into the soil profile. And it's going to churn things up and essentially reclaim the, the, the soils um, to a point where 30 years later, it, you can go from marginal ag land to prime ag land based on the plants that you put in there during the reclamation process following construction. It's hard to really envision what that looks like so far out, but I think in general with energy development, we need to be thinking long-term and some of these, um, you know, in terms of oil and gas development, these rigs could be there, you know, apparently according to the internet, 20, 30 years, or, you know, whenever they dry up, it, it could be variable, but um, it's a long, it's kind of the same time frame as what we're seeing with solar in this case. And um, so there's potential for regeneration of soils. Uh, and that's talked about a lot in the solar world as well. So I do have a study starting up in, in uh, California near Fresno, and 
This one's interesting because it actually has reclaimed well pads on it. It's 9,000 acres. They're not pictured here. but And we're going to include those as treatments in our study. And these are all on salt-affected ag land, which there's a ton of in California. And the idea is the solar company is coming in. They're going to build a 9,000-acre solar facility uh, in this area on all these salt-affected ag lands. And part of the management plan that is being developed right now, um, you know, there's there's plants that can be put in the ground that can aid in, in phytoremediation. There's plants in terms of uh, salt around here, you know, if you can have plants that grow below that salt profile and exist through time, and then apparently the salt just goes away somehow. <laughs> You, Nat, Natalie can explain that to you. And then, um, but the idea is that like, there's a lot of opportunity, I feel like here to kind of get at some of the stuff y'all are talking about in terms of the, the brine spills and, and things of that nature, where there's actually a, a reclamation process being proposed here that entails uh, phytoremediation and then also just another use for the land. It's just sitting there. There's nothing going on. And so maybe that's a good place to put solar. Agrivoltaics is another example of co-location. Um, and I don't, I don't think it's super relevant here, but the idea is that there's lots of stuff going on in terms of co-location with regards to solar. And I think in terms of pipelines and, and things of that nature, it could just be more broadly, just in a conservation context, the co-location of conservation activities and, and pipelines. But we want to be thinking about how to get the most bang for our buck in these disturbed sites. So if you're going to go and reclaim them, you know, what else can we do? Like, how else can it be built out to achieve multiple objectives that might span beyond just the box that gets checked? And if you were to do that, how might that affect your optics? How might that affect, you know, your capacity as a company to uh, to continue forth in this era. Floating solar is another co-location. So I have some uh, collaborators at Cornell that are dealing a lot with the social acceptance of, of solar energy development in New York State. And in general, a lot of folks think that solar facilities have have high potential or good synergies to be built on essentially what you would might consider marginalized lands or um, lands that have been already affected versus other lands such as forests, which there actually is forest clearing in New York for solar energy development going on. But uh, the idea here is that you know if you already have like severely disturbed lands or degraded lands, and that could be a good place to put solar. At least that's what people think in New York, and I don't know what they think about it here, but I think there's uh, potentially some good synergy in terms of where to put solar on around here on some, some of these degraded lands. And I'm gonna show an example in a second. But the idea here is that, you know, the bigger the bar, um, they think it belongs more. There are these, uh, a big thing that's going on right now on sites where you have abandoned mines, so mountaintop removal sites and such out east, they're starting to put solar panels there. And this is kind of to bring it back full circle the, to the co-location idea or the use of these marginalized lands. Maybe instead of uh, reclaiming some of these well pads or what have you to uh, you know some vegetative state, what if it's just land where you can put solar? I don't know, or put something else there. Um, and that's something maybe to consider as well, because it's happening quite a bit in um, in the case of these abandoned uh, or these mines that are just done now. And it's we're seeing it a lot out east uh, currently. So I looked up some and preparing for this talk, I looked into some of the definitions of of reclamation and how they sort of evolve through time, at least in the academic literature. 
And I recognize that reclamation, there are legal definitions, right, that seem to be important <laughs> in terms of how it gets done and why people are doing things. Um, and I think that in this case, it kind of brings to light, to me anyway, that, you know, whether it's reclamation or restoration or whatever your definition might be, I think it it would it's good to kind of push it a little bit, push it to the limit. Like if, if reclaiming a site is to check a box, is there a way to extend beyond that? And then why would you do that? Well, I don't know. It's good for the world. <laughs> but even still, like I'm learning with these renewable energy companies, it's all about optics for them. And I think that there's a lot to be said for, you know, pushing the limit on on co-benefits or synergies, uh, basically to look good. <laughs> At least that's what they're doing. So I think it's uh, there's something to be said for trying to, you know, do more, I guess. But it's not just about doing more. I think it's for a slight increase in effort or maybe just a re-envisioning of how reclamation is defined. You could get at multiple uh, benefits for for ecosystems and, and socially. So I will end my talk by saying that, you know, hopefully some of this was useful. I think it's it's interesting for me to learn about some of the differences between oil and gas development and renewable energy development. I think there are more similarities and differences, actually. It's kind of tough to apply some of the research that I've done in the past because, you know, some of these well pads are there are, you know, there's a fair number of them and, and they're somewhat um, some of them are quite a bit smaller than the solar facilities I've dealt with. But in terms of thinking about this from a broad philosophical standpoint or thinking about it in the terms of, of, of uh, pipelines, which are quite extensive, um, I think a lot of these these principles would apply just in terms of thinking about on the front end, what can we do with siting? What can we do with site preparation? How can we set ourselves up for success down the road, reduce environmental mitigation costs? And then on the back end, thinking about how can we build out our kind of concept of reclamation to include things like co-benefits and, and, and synergies reducing things like dust, reducing things like noise. These are all things that actually I think can be um, accomplished or at least mitigated by kind of uh, pushing for those co-benefits. So thanks a lot for having me and I can take any questions. I don't know exactly how to ask, so maybe it's more to elaborate on something. Um, you know, kind of looking, talking about some of these solar facilities, so 9,000 acres. So comparing just kind of maybe that compared to some of the passport stuff that that's more the disturbance we have holistically in a landscape approach how, how are the different ways to like maybe think about those not even on the reclamation but like active management of those things to promote you know you know to me it seems like it's completely different how you want to look at a landscape ecology between a nine thousand acre thing compared to 600 acres you might have for 10 acres for the Sure. Yeah, so I didn't quite elaborate on this in the talk, but the idea is that I think cumulatively, these patches can actually make a difference across the landscape if you were to have, you know, targeted reclamation, for example, for pollinator habitat. Let's say you have, what, a thousand well pads or all five acres a piece or whatever it might be. We're starting to see in in these 9,000 acre facilities or in the, in the case of Ivanpa, the results that I presented, it's about 6,000 acres. What we were seeing is that these very small patches, these were less, way less than an acre uh, in size. These small patches had conservation value. Um, if they were left undisturbed, we were seeing a positive response from pollinators. And so what I'm suggesting is that it's possible that if there was, for example, I mean, using pollinator habitat as, as an example, if you were to go and and reclaim all these well pad sites to some state where there's pollinator habitat and in turn 
these are providing resource islands for pollinators. And then there's, you know, co-benefits for pollination services for neighboring crops because the sugar beet factory closed down. You need to diversify your crop portfolio, for example. Um, there, I think there might be a connection. I think in terms of, you know, and that's on the reclamation side, in terms of the, the kind of physical disturbance from the construction activities itself, I think there's probably more parallels between uh, the pipelines and uh, some of these larger solar facilities. But I guess what I'm getting at is from the landscape ecology perspective, the, the concept itself of patches applies. And if you, if you were to re reclaim patches, you could have a cumulative effect across the landscape and interactions between the patches and surrounding landscape. Mm -hmm.